All right. Uh, good evening. It is January 10th, uh, 2023. This is our first council meeting of the new year. And I am calling the regular meeting of the Common Council uh, to order. We're in the council chambers uh, in Platteville. Uh, Candace, we'll start with roll call. Ken Killian? Here. Eileen Nichols? Here. Kathy Kopp? Here. Jason Arts? Here. Lynn Parrott? Here. Todd Casper? Here. Barbara Doss? Here. And tonight we're going to start uh, uh, with uh, recognition of our departing or resigning or leaving. Is there an acronym you want to use? So, uh, Adam, I think you'll have to join me at the no. podium because I, I suspect, Ken, uh, that uh, Jody will want me to read this again for the general public. And as we start, special thanks to all the people who came for your reception. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for those in the audience, if you want to have a second piece of cake, yeah. <laughs> it would be okay. Eat cake. So this is a proclamation recognizing Adam Wrinkle's outstanding service and dedication to the city of Platteville. Whereas Adam joined the city of Platteville staff as city manager in January of 2020, and whereas Adam was immediately faced with leading a city safely through the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, even before meeting and forming relationships with many of the people he would need to work with, and whereas Adam's collaborative leadership style supported a unified staff that found new ways to work and work together under that type of duress, a common council that adopted new technology and continued to address pressing issues to move the city forward and cohesive community leadership that stressed personal health and safety. And whereas during his three-year tenure, tenure as city manager, Adam has established and led a team who have worked together to update the vision and mission statements of the city, finalize the capital improvement planning process, develop a long-range staffing plan, and create a forum to address inclusivity, diversity, and equity in our community. And whereas Adam has worked diligently to analyze fire facility needs and implement a plan to construct a new facility, including site acquisition and resource development. And whereas Adam has worked to promote Platteville through collaborative marketing initiatives, as well as the Platteville Pickaxe and Living Local and Loving It video series, have supported efforts to develop additional housing within the city and has been focused on business recruitment and expansion. And whereas Adam supported citizen-led community amenity development, including the construction of the Trine Sanders Pickleball Complex and Platteville Inclusive, Inclusive Playground, and whereas Adam has immersed himself and his family in the Platteville community, living our motto of pioneering the good life and making our mark. Now, therefore, I, Barb Dawes, council president of the city, on behalf of the common council and city employees, both past and present, do hereby wish to express our sincere appreciation to Adam for his dedication and service to the city of Platteville. Thank you. <laughs> Can. Uh, sure, I guess I can do it in round two. Um, no, I think first and foremost, I want to thank um, obviously every single council member for three years ago, you took a chance on a relatively unknown um, kind of new uh, manager to run this city. And it has been an absolute pleasure uh, from day one and continues to be a pleasure uh, at this moment as well. Uh, to be called the city manager for the city of Platteville. Uh, this is definitely a bittersweet moment. Um, because in the last three years, we have done uh, a lot, uh, not only for the staff, uh, which again, a lot of the accomplishments that were read in that proclamation uh, could not have been done by myself. Uh, we have an amazing staff here at the city of Platteville. Uh, so again, my thanks go out to each and every one of you. Uh, you're going to get one more question of the day tomorrow. So get excited and start thinking about that. Um, but they have been a joy to work with on all of our projects and the hours that we have put in, uh, again, is a testament to the dedication, not only of this council in trusting the employees to get the job done when we have to do projects, uh, but also goes out to all of our community members, um, and organizations for the amazing things that we've been able to accomplish in the three years that I've been here. Uh, and my goal, obviously, in starting in day one was to make sure that when I left here, the city was in a good place. And I can truly say that now leaving and departing, uh, this city is in a good place and has a lot of things to look forward to. Um, and again, it has been an honor 
and a privilege um, that you allowed me to live out truly a, a lifelong dream of being a manager for a, a major municipality. Uh, and I'm not going away too yet, so I'll still be around for a little bit. Um, but again, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for uh, the time that I was able to be here. Uh, and it will always be a, a pleasure to have been known that I was a city manager for the city of Plateau. So thank you guys very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, and uh, for those in attendance, uh, Nicola will be our interim manager starting, uh, I guess, is Monday a holiday for us? Ooh. No. All right, so we don't have Monday as a holiday, but she will be our interim manager starting very soon. All right, then the first thing on our agenda tonight then is a public hearing. This is resolution 2301, discon street discontinuance, Jones Street. We'll start with staff presentation, Joe. Yes, thank you. Um, so we received a request to discontinue the remaining portion of Jones Street. So Jones Street is kind of a, a street remnant uh, located uh, south of uh, Main Street uh, be on the block between Main Street, Court Street, Pine Street, and Chestnut Street. Uh, essentially, it's between uh, Steve's Pizza, The Ticket, and Hardig uh, Drug is what's remaining. Um, so most of that street was discontinued uh, back in 1975. There was another small discontinuance approved back in 2016 when uh, Steve Spitz was looking at doing a, a expansion of the restaurant and adding a brewery to that location. Um, so kind of the western 12 feet of a portion of that was discontinued at that point. Uh, that project did not happen, the Steve Spitz expansion, but instead it, it evolved into uh, the project to add a brewery uh, into the building at 45 South Chestnut Street, which that work has already begun. They're remodeling that building. They're actually doing a small expansion to that building. But as part of that project, they're anticipating the need for space to locate some additional equipment to support that brewery. So they'd like to put it behind the building, um, which would be into the Jones Street, what is now the Jones Street right away. Um, so the request came in to discontinue that as a street to allow that to be converted to public property so that could be used for uh, locating that equipment. Um, so even though it's a small uh, section of a street and all the properties that kind of have frontage on that do have street frontage on those other streets, um, most of those uh, properties on that block still use uh, that section of Jones Street for access. Um, either for rear parking areas behind their buildings to access the rear of the building entrances themselves or for garbage and recycling collection to the rear. Um, so it's important that some access be maintained in that area for all of the properties on that block. Um, so that is the, the main concern that staff has regarding the request to discontinue all of that. Um, the, the, the portion that's left is essentially 66 feet by 36 feet. It's only a 36 feet wide uh, street as it was platted. Uh, normally in our ordinance um, for parking lots, for example, to allow two-way traffic, you have to have 24 feet of width to allow that. So um, I would be hesitant to uh, discontinue the street without having at least a 24 foot wide access of some point either to keep the street of that width or an easement uh, of that width to allow access to those properties. Um, <clears throat> so that was kind of the, the issue as presented to the plan commission. We looked at it and uh, the options provided to them from the staff was either recommend denial, recommend approval with a 24 foot wide easement or recommend a partial discontinuance of the street to maintain 24 feet uh, of that street. Um, so the plan commission, uh, their recommendation uh, from the December meeting was to basically just con discontinue the western 12 feet of that street. So there would still be 24 feet uh, remaining. Um, so that would provide the access to the other properties. It would give the applicant 12 feet, um, actually it'd be 12 feet by 34 feet. It would be the portion immediately behind that, that 45 South Chestnut Street building to locate um, their equipment. So that is the recommendation of the plan commission and staff would also agree with that recommendation. Any questions? 
Any questions from the council? Again, the plan commission looked at this and is recommending not discontinuing the street, but only a portion 12 like feet by Western, 34 feet, 12 feet the portion directly behind uh, the current, uh, the building that's currently under construction. So the next thing on uh, our agenda then in terms of the public hearing would be the applicant statement. Is the applicant here? Uh, Dan Dressens with Delta Three Engineering, representing Updraft Brewery, uh, for this request. Um, as Joe mentioned, um, the, the initial application was to request that the entirety of Jones Street be discontinued, but after discussion with the Planning Commission, um, uh, we did agree that only the, uh, the the western twelve feet of the uh, street could be would need to be discontinued. Um, that way, we, we still provide twenty four foot access to uh, the rear of the ticket as well as uh, the rear of some other buildings at Front, Court Street, and Main Street. Um, and then we don't have to worry about doing additional easements. Um, we felt that, uh, and talking with Joe ahead of the meeting, that this was going to be the cleanest. And then the 12 feet does provide uh, enough room to do what is proposed for Updraft Brewery. Um, and they're looking at maybe some external uh, tanks, as well as a place to put uh, to garbage uh, enclosure as well. Um, Joe mentioned that in a newer air, a newer parking lot, that the requirement is 24 feet for two-way access for a parking lot, and that is correct. Um, that only leaves 12 feet, and we do know that there are, you know, a handful of public parking stalls here. But a typical parking stall in the city of Plavo is minimum of 18 foot of depth. So um, we would like to point out that whenever someone does park back there, whether they're at 90 degree or at an angle, um, 30 degree or 60 degree parking that they are actually, the rear of the vehicle protrudes out into that 24 foot drive lane, which then if there's nobody parked behind the ticket property, they have to swerve around if there would be two cars parked, two cars going in both directions. Now, granted that does not happen very often, but that is the reality of it. Um, that if this was, if we were proposing to put parking back here, we wouldn't be allowed to. Um, so I know that it's been on the maps for many years, um, but uh, it's really, um, non-conforming parking. Um, would also like to point out that um, I do believe that uh, Mr. Patakos um, pretty much maintains this back area between him and the ticket in terms of maintenance and snow plowing. So um, even though it's a public street, it's very difficult to have city staff get in there and clean it out. So if there's any questions, I can answer them at this time. Any questions of the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll move on to public statements in favor. And I haven't actually had anybody registered to speak in favor. Uh, or pu and public, uh, public statements against. And Jane Stark has registered to speak against this discontinuation. Hi. My name is Jane Stark. I own Jane's Family Hair Care, located at 30 South Court Street. Uh, when I bought this building in 1997, there were five parking places on Jones Street at that time, and they were 24-hour parking. So I thought, that's, that's wonderful. If I ever need to add on to my business, I could take my renter's parking places, add on, and there would still be 24-hour parking for renters, possibly. Um, well, now we are not going to have any parking back there if this goes through. Now... Um, Heisers were going to, you know, how you came up, you gave people the parking places through the years, and the deal was they were going to add on to this one building in Platteville. Well, however, neither one added on, but they got all the parking places. So being a business person in that area, we have a lot of traffic. We have people coming in all the time, almost every day saying, I'm sorry, I'm late, could not find a parking place. So the, we all know that parking is a problem. 
Now, John was going to add on, which is, is great. I'm for business to do well. But he received at that time two parking places behind his kitchen. That was going to be where he was going to put his silos to begin with for his brewery. Now, I'm wondering, could he use that particular spot for his silos? He already owns it. So, you know, I just hate to see us losing more parking. We've lost all the parking back there. There's like 17 parking places that are gone to any of the other businesses to use. And a lot of times it's not filled up. So um, I'm wondering if, I, I do have also questions too about the grain truck coming in and out. I worked at Heiser Hardware for quite a few years. The freight would be delivered, they would drive in and we'd unload the freight and then they'd have to back out onto Main Street. Now, luckily at that time, Main Street was a one-way street. Now we have a two-lane Main Street. So now is that gonna create a problem for the delivery of the grain? Uh, how big are these silos going to be? Um, what about rodents and birds? I know years ago we had some problems with a lot of birds in the city of Platteville. Um, so that could create a problem. Um, also, I was wondering if at this time, we have to make sure people are going to follow through with what they say they're going to do. We can't just be giving away property and, and they're not doing it. I, I just, I feel that that's not right. That's not a right thing to do. So I think right now, I think you should table it for now. And I know John had stated at the meeting that he was going to try by June to get his brewing business going. He can brew his beer without having the silos. He said that if his business, if his business was going to take off, now we don't know about businesses, if they go or they don't go. So if his business goes, then he wants to build these silos in the fall. But if his business doesn't go, I mean, and I, I hope he can do whatever, but if it doesn't go, then he's not gonna put them up at all. And then he will have the property like he got before. So I think it should be tabled. I think he should have to um, come back when he is ready to put this up and um, possibly show you proof that he is going to build it, have the contractors, have a date set up um, for construction, because I just don't think it's really fair. Now, let me see if I have another question. I think that was about it. And so can we park back there as it is now? We've been parking back there for years and there's usually three people, you know, that can park behind there. So I guess I would really like to see you table this and wait and see what his business does. I think before we shouldn't have done what we did in the first place, and we should have made sure that these people were gonna follow through before we give them all the parking. So I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jane was the only person who had registered to speak against. Um, Mr. Hardig, Charles Hardig, has registered to speak for informational purposes. So, Mr. Hardig. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me, members of the council. This is my first Platteville Common Council, so 
it was pretty cool that I got to arrive and cake was sitting out for me. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just want to speak briefly about uh, a few of the the comments the previous commenter had and also um, just some considerations that I'd like the council to consider. Uh, I have uh, exchanged abbreviated emails with John, um, and he's assuaged most of my fears about this potential expansion. And I am generally in favor of of local business owners being one myself. So uh, with these comments and and these these, uh, suggestions to consider, please keep that in mind. Uh, I do agree that uh, you know, you know, driving through there and, and working in that in that drive through at Hardig Drug, which is in the alleyway, mm-hmm. uh, my pharmacy staff is is a bit concerned about the noise of potential construction, which you know is temporary. So I just want want to make that note. And then also, um, in that drive through, there is uh, on occasion folks who will try to take a right into Jones Street to come out. Not it is two way. Um, and I'm I'm fearful that uh, instituting the minimum uh, amount of uh, two-way traffic in that parking area will cause uh, some traffic buildup. I'm also concerned uh, when you look at the parking that is in there in the back and where people park currently, um, not everyone pulls up to that 18-foot depth. So I think there is a concern that truly there won't be a two-way uh, ability to, to ingress and egress two way there. Um, I think looking at the practical realities of the space. So uh, I'm not sure that, that was uh, considered in, in totality, but you know, looking at whether a traffic study or looking at whether uh, practical parking rearranging could be done would probably be something that I think be prudent. Um, I think my biggest concern ultimately is impact to patient access for medication. Um, you know, folks who use the drive through are the ones who usually can't get into the store, whether it be the mom with two toddlers in the back or um, someone who's non-ambulatory, who has a hard time getting in and out of the car. So just, just please keep those concerns in mind as you consider these proposals. Um, and if they haven't, if they weren't considered the planning committee, um, I would hope that uh, they do, they are considered either here or, you know, if you, you know, remand this issue to the planning committee, that so be it. Um, I am not in faith, I'm not against uh, moving forward with this plan, but I do think that there are complexities to this that probably aren't reflected in the record. Um, and then finally, excuse me. Finally, I just am uh, questioning the ability of uh, neighbors to get notice when planning commission uh, agenda items will affect other neighbors. I'm not sure if there's a notice period when streets cl- are uh, discontinued, but we didn't receive any notice on the initial planning commission meeting, and we didn't receive any notice officially from the city uh, for this meeting. So I'm not sure or aware of, of how that process works, but uh, or if that process exists. But I would just, you know, I'm happy to follow up with anyone at the city afterwards to, to talk through that process, but would love to see if. Uh, discontinuances are on the agenda or uh, matters that affect property owners or adjacent property owners would love to to see um, the, the city you know reach out either with a certified mail or or an email even simply just to to notify property owners I was lucky enough that I have a civically engaged pharmacist Gina Pitts and she said hey did you know this is going on and I did my research and I, I came out here so um, I appreciate your time uh, and thank you very much um I also have another person who's registered to speak for information purposes, Ela Cockney. Hello, Ela Cockney with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. I just wanted to address again for informational purposes, uh, the timeline I think that uh, is intended for this development. Um, some questions have been brought up about you know past timelines. The intention I think. Um, is looking at moving forward with a moving forward with the development of this redevelopment of this location, um, dependent on going after a CDI community development investment grant, which would be something that I think the the owner is looking to do in conjunction with the city. So, um, thinking about uh, the types of development you want in your city. At the same time, thinking about it in terms of how those are going to impact your existing businesses, I just want to put it out there that this would be a very good candidate for receiving a community development investment grant. And um, if that was the case, then that would keep on the timeline that the 
the developer wanted to do that updraft brewing went to go on to. So I just wanted to address that in terms of timeline. Thank you. Okay, those are that is uh, those are the folks who have registered now to speak uh, public statements. So now we have council discussion. So people who have questions, concerns, need clarification. Just had a question. Lynn? I have a question for uh, the young man, the Hardy. Well, actually, you all have to ask that question to staff. Yeah. Okay. You're right. I haven't been in a week. Okay. The, he has, I put down, what do you suggest? So he had an issue with um, people not being able to get to the pharmacy if the street is closed is what I'm understanding. And I had, I just wanted to know, like, I'm always looking for suggestions. If you have an issue, what do you suggest we do? So that was going to be my question. Like, what would be the alternative if that street is closed and people can't get to their pharmacy? Hey, Joe, the Joe, can you respond to um, access for the pharmacy yeah, so the, window? The pharmacy drive-up window actually uses that alley that goes from Court Street to Chestnut Street. Mm -hmm. That alley will remain. There's no impact on that alley. Um, but if there's a vehicle parked at the drive-up window and somebody needs to go around that vehicle, then they would uh, drive into this portion of Jones Street, which is Again, part of the reason to maintain a, a portion of that. So the it, the alley would still be open. You just can't park in the alley. Yeah, you can't park, park in the alley the but regardless. Can you park in the alley now? No. no. Okay, so you can't park in the alley. So uh, the difference that you're describing is that if I'm stopped at the drive through window for heartache drug and Eileen comes up behind me, and she wants to get around, uh, she would be able to get around by using this 24 feet that would be remaining. Right. And, and actually, when, when uh, Hardig was given approval to use that alley for their drive-through, there was a, a condition that they get an easement from the ticket property, which would have been previous owners, which would also give them part of that ability to get around. So it'd be a combination of their tickets parking area and this uh, portion of Jones Street. So access to the pharmacy it should not drive be, up window it should, should not, not be, be affected. affected. All right. Okay. Other questions? Just going to make a statement. I, I take a look at John Patakos and his family who've ran a successful business in the city of Platteville for approximately 40 years. There's no question in my mind that if he makes a plan to develop a brewery that it's going to be successful at least to some level. We've also supported other business, and there's an example of it here just brought up how we changed the direction of an alley and made it one way to support another business. So I think any time a business comes with a good plan and it's not going to affect others in a, in a detrimental way that we support it, and uh, this would probably be just another good example of that. Mm -hmm. We also talked about in the Planning Commission, if this street is ever divided, that John has his share already and these other businesses would get theirs. So nobody loses here. And like I said, again, just to support, if you're in business for 40 years in the community and you've done well, there's no reason to, to second guess them. Thank you, that's it. Hey, other questions or comments? Um, just a little bit of Please. clarification. I'm trying to visualize the area. Um, so there are no parking spots within the alley. What? area is kind of the the contention now in terms of potentially losing parking spots uh so it'd be immediately behind that 45 south chestnut street where the the brewery is going there are vehicles that kind of angle park behind that building right, right up to the building. okay so and jason can you bring up the maps in your packet mm -hmm. and it appears on my map anyway it appears there are two almost looks like red cars right? Yeah. or maroon cars that are kind of angle parked. This would be on page nine. And I don't know what page that would be for you, Ken. But it'd be on page nine. 
there's an aerial photo in there that right. Shows there's an aerial photo and it shows those two cars. So it's right behind there. Uh, yeah. That would be the loss of parking. Okay. So to speak. And is that technically like official parking right now, or do people just use it as a parking spot? I mean, it's part of the city right away. I don't know if we've ever how we've ever designated it over the years. I haven't. It's, just, it's it been used as parking. I don't know if it's been officially designated or not. Okay. Okay. Hey, other questions? Okay, I have a question about brought up by Jane Stark. Um, how many vehicles would you need space for as far as parking for, has... your, for your business? Uh, Jane, you can't speak from the, and can you really, so you'll have to come back to the podium and, and you have two parking spots for your residence. Is that right? You have one parking spot and it's right behind her building. Can, uh, I guess, do you have this? I have this right here. No, you have the other map. I guess you didn't get he didn't get the overhead map in his packet. He must have, oh, here it is. This is Jane's building and she has a parking space here. So she comes in and goes that way. We're talking about this street right here. That's what I'm wondering about is whether she can be provided parking Coming off of Main Street, for example, that's not too far away. Well, I would think that her customers could park in any parking space or lot that's available. Where do you think they could park in addition to the one? I don't, I don't think, Jane, come back to the podium, but your customers don't use your parking spot in back your building. The parking spot in back of Jane's building is used by her tenant that lives on the second floor. So her current customers park in whatever parking is available, whether it be on Court Street, on Main Street, on uh, where uh, Chestnut Street, on you name it, they park in a public, in an area of public parking. But in my book, it shows an easement back here from Jane Stark going back. Why can't she be provided two spaces back here? That's an alley. That's right. Right. And that's about an eight foot alley. Is that right? That people don't drive through the alley between your business and I don't even know who's next to you. The ticket. But, but they can no. walk, they could walk through the alley to get to the business. John's apartment building. Oh, it's an apartment building. Yeah. So that 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 alleyway is not really a drive alley. No, I don't think I've ever seen. All right. But her customers park like other customers do at downtown businesses in the parking places in the downtown. But I'm suggesting that uh, they, they could give up some parking here on the street coming, coming from Maine. That's not too far away. Okay. Other, other questions. Uh, it's not yes. a question, but it's it's a comment. Um, I understand the parking issues in the downtown, but um, this development, I I would have a concern. Um tabling it until we see if if you know it's actually going to be completed because planning needs to be done and I don't know how you would even engineer the the whole project if you didn't know for sure that that space would be available I don't I that might end that project if if he couldn't have that space for his um, proposed silos. 
Any other comments or questions? I do have one question right now. There's a drive through window for Steve's Pizza. Will that drive through window remain? So that drive through will remain as it is. Okay. And is that is that road, Joe, marked one way going from north to south? I think it's north to south. Is Jones Street currently marked at all in terms of direction? So um, coming off of Main Street, Steve's Pizza over the years has put arrows pointing to the south, but Jones Street itself has never officially been designated as one way. Okay, and coming from Main Street, Steve's Pizza owns Jones Street. How far? All except the last 66 feet. So I don't know what that is. All right, all the except 100, the last 124 60... feet. It's 124 feet from from Main Street to where so it's not... currently Steve's Pizza owns half of that anyway. Yeah, they half yeah. of that Jones Street space. Correct. So can the parking I down here? I have the same question. Is the drive-up window going to be used by Steve's Pizza in that narrow alley coming from, uh, what is it, Jones Street and turning right and going toward Chestnut? It's one way the other way, the drive through So right? the, the drive through for Steve's Pizza? Is that the one you're talking about or the Hardick drive through No, Steve's Pizza. Steve's Pizza, they enter off of Chestnut Street. Chestnut. And come in so they're and going turn right onto Jones Street and then back out the other. So they can go on Jones Street either way. The throw is either way no. or only to the right. So the portion that's owned by Steve's Pizza is one way headed south. Is how they always have it designated. So they... Theoretically, they would come in and have to turn right and then have to turn right again because the alley is one way heading west. Ted, uh, at Plan Commission, we talked and, and I would like to see this motion include, if this is going to be discontinued, I would like to see an addition to that motion that says that the alley has been divided already and if a further subdivision the people on the east side would be uh getting 18 feet and the people on the west side would only be getting six because i don't i don't want any 20 years from now somebody saying well that's a street it's 12 and 12. no the first division if the 12 have been made then the only thing going to the properties to the set to the south or west west would be six feet and the properties on the east side would get 18 feet that's the way it should be i think i mean i see chris is sitting here from the ticket jane is sitting here they have adjudging properties and they should get their 18 feet because when streets are discontinued the uh statue is half goes to one and half goes to the other. My concern is 20 years from now, when none of us are here, half goes to one and half goes to the other, and that's not really true. So I'd like to see it put something in the motion, if a motion is made to do this, that clarifies that property, the properties that have already gotten 12 feet would only get six more. Yeah, and I would suggest we, we could add that to the resolution as well. So it's easier to find than looking through old minutes. I guess if no one else has any other questions, I have a motion then. Well, we have to close the public hearing first. Okay. So is there any other questions of staff? Any other council discussion? Otherwise, I would take a motion to close the public hearing. So be it. Okay, okay Candace will vote. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Same. Cop? Yes. 
Arts? Yes. Parrot? Casper? Yes. And Doss? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, now do I hear any action? This could be a motion. I to move the table. table. Okay, hey, we have a motion to table. Is do we need a second to a motion to table? Is there a second to the motion to table? Is there a second to the motion to table? Second to motion to table. With no second, the motion to table fails. I have a motion. Okay, Todd. Motion to approve the discontinu discontinuance of Western uh, 12 feet by 34 foot portion of Jones Street located adjacent to the property at 45 South Chestnut Street with the understanding that historically, if the street is ever divided, that it be viewed that this 12 by 34 foot portion has already been removed uh, from that discontinuance and the other property owners would receive the share they should have received from the first historical division. How's that? How's that, Joe? Is that okay? Or do you want it to say? So I, I would say that the eastern 18 feet would go to the properties to the east and the remaining six okay. feet would go eastern to the Eastern 18 feet would go to the properties to the east if it were ever discontinued with the western six feet going to the properties to the west. Same thing. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Candace will vote. Killian. No. Nichols. Same. Cop. Yes. Arts. Yes. Parrot. Casper. Yes. Doss. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, moving on in our agenda then. Uh, the next item is our consent agenda. Uh, the following may be approved on a single and motion and vote. There are council minutes from uh, December 13th. Uh, the bills have been included, uh, preliminary financial report for December. And tonight I am appointing, appointing Marv Packer to the uh, Commission on Aging. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. We'll vote. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Cobb? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the, uh, there, the only other citizens' comments I have, observations or petitions, relate to upcoming agenda items. Um, any council members have anything that they want to share? I believe we have an upcoming Miners Ball on February 4th. February 4th. Tickets are available if you contact the museum, go online. Okay. Any other activities people want to uh, stress? Otherwise, there are reports tonight in your packets, the Historic Preservation Commission report from September. Ken, anything? No addition. Water and Sewer Commission from November. Uh, Eileen or Ken? No addition. No, none. Commission on Aging, Kathy? Just a comment that at our next meeting, um, we're going to be hearing from James Schneider, um, who's with UW Extension for Grant County. He's going to be make some new branding. Okay. <clears throat> Community safe routes, Jason. Uh, nothing to add. Police and Fire Commission, Kathy. <clears throat> nothing to add. Other reports in your packet are the water and sewer preliminary report for December, the airport financial report preliminary for December, uh, information from the task force on inclusion, diversity, and equity, and department progress reports. Any questions on any of these Inclusions, or is there anybody that wants to say anything about them? I have a couple questions. Okay. Uh, police report. It says Kyle Crook resigned after over five years. And then on our needs, uh, things that need attention, city manager, city council, my question is, will there be a report as far as 
this individual, why this individual resigned and what can be done as far as uh, anything that needed to, to have these people stay longer in a position. The so, city manager is fully aware of the circumstances for Kyle's resignation. So is that going to be provided to the, to the common council? It's a personnel matter. So we can't find out anything. Personnel matter at this point. I can reach out to you individually, Ken, and give you an update on what's going on there. <laughs> Okay, then my next question is about um, something to do with the um, report as far as um, building an alley. And I think the alley is from uh, Oak to Forth. And my question is, is this the only alley that's going to be worked on in the city of Blackpool in 2023? That is correct. So there's no other alley going to receive any payment, and the payment total possible is twenty thousand dollars. Correct. So, and my next question is, how many people turned in requests for work on an alley? Um, a number of a number of them. I don't have a specific number. I know that uh, um, the folks on that one alley that that we've been discussing uh, between Oak and 4th Street, uh, north of and parallel to Furnace Street. Uh, they've been asking for a while. Plus, uh, when our people um, work on it, they, they've, they've had some issues with that as well. Um, we've also had people uh, uh, ask about the alley. Uh, would be the continuance of uh, uh, Carlisle Street um, to the east, and it uh, wraps around and uh, from Roundtree and goes north to Alden Avenue. That's been another one that people have talked about. Uh, there have been other alleys that, you know, some in the downtown area and some in other areas that. Um, that people have have talked about and asked about. Um, I was under the impression that, um, you know, this program regarding alleys would be a multiple year program to, um, because of budgetary considerations, we would do one or two alleys at the most uh, every year for the next few years. And uh, so that's, that's the plan right now is this one would be first and then we would be looking at at other ones as, in the future. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on the department progress reports or the uh, report from the tide committee task force. Okay, then we'll go along to the the only agenda item we have action item we have on our agenda tonight and that is the armory rfp so uh i guess it's a tag team show with bob and adam yep so i will start and then i'll let bob fill in any gaps that i may uh miss here so um obviously director low and city manager Riekler are pleased to come to the council tonight with two proposals that exceed the minimum terms of the armory rfp uh, so the original RFP was obviously attached in your packet uh, as well as online. A quick summary of the minimum terms again. Number one was the purchase price of the subject property, which is the Armory Lot 1, was to be at least $135,000. Uh, the property and all improvements are being sold as is. The closing will take place no later than January 31st, 2023, per the Department of Military Affairs. And the city of Platteville will have access to and use of the gymnasium for all its regularly scheduled activities, programming for a period of at least five years, and then the developer obviously had an opportunity to propose the terms of the lease. Uh, the number five, the Wisconsin Department of Military Affairs will have use of an office space not less than 150 square feet and storage space not less than 50 square feet for a period of at least five years. Again, the developer had the ability to propose the terms of the lease. 
Uh, so three proposals were submitted uh, to the city of Platteville for potential buyers. In full disclosure, one of those proposals was from a company partially owned and operated by Director Lowe, the city's park and recreation director. Uh, that proposal was withdrawn as it was conditioned that if any other proposals were presented that at least met the minimum terms, then it was to be immediately withdrawn. Uh, the remaining two proposals do exceed the minimum terms and present an excellent opportunity for the city. Uh, both potential purchasers have experience in real estate and ongoing business currently owned in the city of Platteville. Uh, both meet the general intent of the proposal in exceeding the city's purchase price, providing use of the gym for youth activities and being good stewards of the property. Uh, so proposal A is from the owner operator, Brian Fritz of Pioneer Property Management Incorporated. And the summary of in terms are obviously included in your packet. Um, I don't need to go over them unless you want to go into much detail there. But then as you can see then for proposal B, it's from Chris Richards, a, a group of investors who would form an LLC if selected. Uh, Chris is the current owner of the Ticket Bar and Grill and then supplied the, uh, the summary of terms. Uh, from the budget and fiscal impact, obviously in reviewing the budgetary and fiscal impact, both proposals provide the funding necessary to meet the requirements of the DMA purchase price and fairly compensate the city for the purchase of the three lots. Both proposals indicate a utilization charge will be negotiated with the purchaser for the city to utilize the facility for recreation purposes, which is in line with what has been paid in the past for utilization of the facility. One possibility may be to obviously enter in an agreement in lieu of charges that the city will continue to plow the parking lot and clear the sidewalk areas. That could be something that could be negotiated, obviously, between either proposal. Uh, one thing we do want to kind of note is with proposal B, it does indicate the phase plan to develop the three lots into residential housing, which is something council members will want to take into consideration for long-term growth of the overall tax base if the project comes to fruition. Uh, so obviously with the recommendations, city staff would like to reiterate both proposals present an excellent opportunity for the city of Platteville to have the armory property added to the tax base while allowing the park and recreation department to resume functioning out of the armory as it has in years past. Uh, city staff are looking for guidance from council members on which proposal they would like to direct staff to work with the DMA on finalizing. Uh, city staff are requesting the council members vote to enter into an agreement for purchase with one of the submitted proposals. So therefore we can meet the DMA's requirement of closing by uh, January 31st. So obviously what you have here is kind of um, the proposals that have been included in your packet. Uh, the staff note does break down kind of each individual proposal in regards to what they would offer for the armory, what they would offer for the three additional properties. Uh, gives a little bit of background in regards to um, each, you know, proposals, kind of what their businesses currently do and projects that they have done. Uh, also talks about how both would allow the city uh, to utilize the facility, as well as the Department of Military Affairs, and then also provides you a little background in regards to um, potentially what they would do with the property long term. What did I miss, Bob? Both proposals are an excellent opportunity for the city and the Parks and Rec Division especially. Okay, folks, we have two proposals and uh, uh, we've been uh, dealing with this armory issue for way too long in some ways, respects and probably not long enough in others. Um, as I uh, indicated earlier, I believe that our due diligence has gotten us to where we wanted to be. And that would be that the armory would re be retained locally and developed by a local person for use and, and, and go back on the tax base. So most assuredly, I believe that we've met our goal for this facility uh, being retained in the city and developed in the city for use and continued use by the uh, by uh, city rec. So questions. Questions on the proposals? I guess the only question I had was if there was any idea of what type of housing might be planned in the proposal B. Um, I don't know if the, it said specifically. No, so I don't think it said specifically, and that obviously would be a question. Um, you know, I know we did hear some concerns about, you know, specifically with that is what would it be? Anything in regards to that is obviously going to have to go through uh, not only city staff, but potentially then would have to go to the plan commission. So 
that would be conversations if it would be chosen with proposal B, you know, those would be conversations that city staff obviously would start to have with, um, you know, Chris Richards and the LLC that is formed to kind of determine the timeline. There was a timeline that was put in there. So it, you know, it talked about roughly around 2025, 2026 is when they would start to do that. Um, so, you know, when they get to that, those would be conversations that that group would need to be having, not only with Joe, but with the building inspector and obviously the city as a whole to kind of determine what would make the most sense. Joe, can you tell us what that area is zone? I mean, what the surrounding area is zoned? Uh, I believe all the surrounding lots are R2, uh, one and two family residential. The the armory property itself is institutional. Uh, can you also tell us, will uh, when this property transfers, will the people will the owner need to come back for a rezoning from institutional to something else? Uh, that would be dependent on the specific uses in there. Uh, I was just keep glancing at the uh, the list of uses. I think they're going to be okay with the current zoning, um, unless something different is proposed. Uh, they might need approval, but um, you know, it, obviously, the housing we would have to take a look at. That uh, access would be a primary. Right, because at some that. point in time, we just continue to sleep through. Them. Right. I don't remember what the name of the street is, but we did just continue a street through there. <laughs> okay. Lewis Street. Lewis. Okay. Other questions? So is somebody, somebody, so, I mean, somebody's got to say. If, I don't, if there's no questions, I got um, I don't have any more questions, but in terms of just my, uh, where I'm leaning towards out of the two, um, I'm leaning towards proposal B and the things that stood out for me with that was um, just the community focus that stood out in terms of, of the utilization of the space. I think that's really important. Um, the historic preservation um, experience that they have, um, and then also the lead mitigation um, cause that has been kind of one of the bigger things that we've talked about with that building as well, making sure that that all gets taken care of. Um, yeah, so those, uh, in terms of proposal B, those were the big ones that really stood out for me in terms of kind of for myself leaning towards that direction. Okay, any other comments? Ken? I, um, I favor proposal B. I'm especially impressed with the letter from the city of the bill, the city manager, uh, the experience that those people uh, on proposal B have as far as in the bill and around here. And this property, the the armory is uh, now determined historic. And there's a letter of determination already from the state saying that it is historic. This helps as far as receiving tax credits. And this uh, company has had uh, considerable experience getting tax credits for their projects. So I very much favor proposal B. Barbara, I just have a comment that um, I think both, I'm impressed with both proposals. And I think we should really consider ourselves very lucky that we had two local developers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interested in this. Um, so I think that speaks highly of both of them. I would certainly echo all the comments that have already been made. And um, it that the armory will be back in the city and used as it's being used now and expanded perhaps for other uses. So um, actually kudos to Adam for working with the Department of Military Affairs to get this uh, agreement, the opportunity for make an offer on the property. I'm just glad Bob's still here because, you know, starting with his new role, uh, that was a big undertaking. So he has done a great job as well as the rest of the staff and all the, again, we're, we're a team, but this is, I think, again, as Kathy alluded, kudos to 
both of the proposals that we got, um, you know, that goes down to what I've been preaching that we have an amazing uh, group of individuals that when tasked with a challenge, uh, that's the challenge that we put out was, hey, you know, this is a definite benefit to the city. We don't want to lose this, but we need a partnership. And we had two amazing people step up and provide us with an opportunity to continue to do that, to continue to run recreation programming uh, and some potential to do some other things. So it's exciting. Got a motion if we have no other things to go with here. Todd, I, anybody else with questions, comments? I care coming in. I mean, it, I love the whole idea. I've always been a fan of the army coming in. But I like proposal B also for a lot of um, attachment B for a lot of the same reason that everybody thought. Todd. I move to award the Armory RFP to uh, Proposal B and to authorize the City Manager and Parks and Recreation Director to work with the Department of Military Affairs on entering into an official agreement of sale, transfer, and city utilization of the property. Second. Second. Well, <laughs> we have a motion by Todd and a second by uh, Eileen and Ken simultaneously. So you can pick one, Candace. All right. And we'll vote. Gillian. Yes. Nichols. Yes. Cop. Yes. Arts. Yes. Parrot. Yes. Casper. Yes. Doss. Yes. Motion carries. And for those that don't know Chris Richards and his investors, they are in our audience tonight. So thank you, Chris. And I don't know the names of the other two, but uh, we look forward to working with you. And as echoed, two great proposals from very great business people. And uh, we, we're just glad that you, you moved on it. So uh, we look forward to working with you. Okay, uh, let us go then to the information portion of our agenda, the first of which is adding street parking on Chestnut Street. I believe that's you, Howard. Is it? Actually, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so this uh, project or this idea came along uh, as part of the discussions we had on the uh, updraft brewery project. Uh, that's one of the reasons Ela's hanging around because <laughs> we were working on that grant that she mentioned. Um, and the, the way that grant is structured, and she can provide some more uh, detail if needed, but the, the, it really would benefit the grant if there was some uh, additional community involvement in that project. Uh, a lot of times they're looking for financial commitment to the project, which we're not really in a position to do that. Um, so the idea was proposed that, well, if the city were to undertake some uh, expansion of parking that would be available uh, for the customers of that building, you know, that is one of the small pieces to that puzzle that could be viewed as, uh, as community involvement. So that led to the discussion uh, that staff had with the plan commission as far as looking at options for adding parking onto Chestnut Street itself, uh, where there currently are no public spaces identified. Um, so when we looked at that, there there is uh, an area uh, basically right next to the Steve's Pizza building on the east side of Chestnut Street that uh, is wide enough to accommodate parking spaces. It's never historically had parking spaces. Uh, over the years, it's kind of been used as an extra travel lane, uh, even though it's technically not wide enough to accommodate an additional lane of traffic. And people tend to use that as a bypass uh, to get through the intersection if somebody's waiting to turn west onto Main Street from Chestnut Street. Um, so there is room there. Um, and also, as we were looking at it, there, there also is room on the west side of Chestnut Street, south of those existing four spaces um, to accommodate uh, some additional parking before you get to that restricted uh, taper zone uh, on the south part of that Chestnut Street. So. Um, overall, uh, we're proposing an option to provide an additional five parking spaces, three on the east side and two on the west side. Um, we're holding it back a little bit from Main Street on that uh, east side um, so that there still is room for vehicles to maneuver. Uh, there was a concern mentioned at the Planning Commission about you know larger trucks, if they're turning west on Main Street, need a little bit more room to swing at that intersection. So that should provide that additional space. 
um, as well as any vehicles turning to the right. So um, I did uh, measure out and there was also a concern about um, vehicles leaving that alley uh, that we talked about earlier coming from Hardig um, onto uh, Chestnut Street to make sure there was adequate visibility there. Uh, there'd be 90 feet uh, from the alley to the southern part of that parking lot. And uh, actually, visibility-wise, it'd be more than that because the vehicles would be coming from the north. They'd be in the other lane, so you'd have additional distance before you um, uh, actually see those uh, vehicles. Uh, no changes to the south, so it wouldn't impact any visibility um, from that direction. And as I mentioned, there's still... Uh, adequate distance uh, for those spaces on the west side before you get to that restricted taper, uh, 32 feet. So it shouldn't impact any uh, traffic flow um, in that direction as well. So um, that is the proposal uh, for your consideration. The Planning Commission reviewed this and did recommend approval. Any questions? Any <clears throat> questions about this additional parking on Chestnut Street? And I did forward all of you, I don't know if you got it yourself, but I did forward all of you an email that I received from a concerned citizen who, uh, who expressed uh, some opposition to this. Uh, I believe the person's name was Paul Malishki. Is that right? Did I get that right? Paul Malishki. So I did send that to all of you. I don't know. You may have already gotten it from him too. I couldn't. I couldn't tell, but I did want you to have that. Questions, comments, concerns, suggestions. I have Kathy. A couple, Kathy. Question. Couple, couple things. things. Kathy. It's interesting that we're actually looking at adding parking spaces downtown, um, and. I, I personally have always been concerned with that section of Chestnut Street when you're heading north to Maine because it is not there. It is not a turn lane. And a lot of people think just assume it is whether it's marked that way or not. Um, so I I'm looking at it that it it would be a positive because not only would it increase parking, but it would be marked as such that it's actually for parking and not a turn lane. Um, um, my, my one question is though, I'm assuming that those additional parking spots would not be signed updraft parking only. They're open for the general public because with the concern that Jane had, those are viable parking spots for her customers as well. I I see it as being very positive. It's um, as far as um, I think pedestrian concerns are always merited to be discussed, but in the downtown, that that's a busy street. But I think I agree that it's wide enough to allow that. So I, I don't have an issue with it. Other comments, questions? Ken? I have a question about this area that has the number 90 on it. There's a driveway there, which is what, 70, 80 feet long. And that's the driveway for the going into the drive up window, correct? Uh, partially, yes. Part, so part of that driveway is for the Steve's drive up is, window. And they also, the delivery drivers pull in will front that of the building. Be, the whole length of the driveway be kept because I see a vehicle or two driving up past the sidewalk and parking next to the building. So they're going to be able to park next to the building using that driveway or are going to take that driveway out and leave the driveway only for the drive up window. So this proposal would not impact the driveway. But Th these but spaces your, would be further north than that. But your proposal is is including a driveway there. The driveway is included. Uh, the proposal no. 
goes past this driveway and the people, can they drive up past the sidewalk and park next to the building is my question. Yes, it would not impact that. But Joe, please the, clarify. I think Ken's question is, can the only people who are currently parking in front of that building, that is that area owned by Steve's Pizza? Correct. The, the, the only ones that park the there are the, the, the only delivery people drivers. That park in there are the delivery vehicles. So if right. you go by that particular area, you will often see two or maybe three cars pulled in there loading pizza, I suspect. Right. So they are not public parking spots. Right. Yeah. But e either way, the, the spaces that are being proposed are further north I, I, than that curb yes, cut. I understand that. So it will not impact that space. But this all. space where they drive up, is that going to be left as a drive-in? So they Correct. can drive in there any place? Correct. And is that only for people that are delivering things, or can people public park in those? That's private property. Once they get past the sidewalk where these people are parking now, that's private property. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I was just gonna address the concerns from the letter as much as we appreciate people writing in. Um, he did bring up this, the person brought up something about bicycles and that being a danger, a bicycle should be taken their lane of travel. They choose to move between park vehicles and other moving motor vehicles on the street. It's at their own peril. Um, furthermore, I think the person also talked about that, that passing on the right issue that you addressed. And again, that's illegal and uh, perhaps puts pedestrians in more of a danger than anything there, including uh, others who are trying to turn to go east on Maine. So just a couple of those issues I wanted to address. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, this would be on our agenda at the next meeting for it would be moved to action at the next meeting. All right, uh, let's go on to the next parking uh, discussion, which is street parking regulations for Bailey Avenue, Court Street, and Roundtree Avenue. Joe. Yeah, so we, we received some uh, comments from uh, some of the residents uh, in, in this area, basically south of uh, Pine Street, south of downtown, that live on uh, specifically Roundtree Avenue and Bailey Avenue um, regarding the, the regulations uh, for street parking in that neighborhood. Um, uh, a couple of items. One is uh, there's some sections um, on Roundtree Avenue that are not designated with any parking restrictions. There's no parking signs there. So by ordinance, it's supposed to be 48 hour parking. Um, but since it's not signed, I think a lot of people that, that tend to park there do not realize there is any time limit and they tend to park for long periods of time. Um, and then the other concern that was raised with uh, the existing parking on Bailey Avenue uh, there is a restriction there in that first block. It's no parking 3 to 6 a.m., uh, but the issue that comes up now is there are employees um, uh, from the downtown area, specifically Mount City Bank and the post office. From what we discovered, there may be others, too, that uh, tend to park on that stretch um, all day. So there's vehicles that are parked from you know beginning of the workday till the end of the workday. So it's difficult for the residents in the area to utilize that street parking and it, it kind of turns into a parking lot. So they wanted to have that issue addressed. Uh, then as through the conversations, it wasn't really part of the cons uh, initial concerns or complaints, but we realized that there's a section of Court Street in that first block that also does not have any signed parking uh, designation. So it's kind of similar to Roundtree Avenue in that regard. So uh, we did look at the situation. We worked with the plan commission a couple of meetings to come up with some uh, some options for modifying those regulations. Uh, so the second page in there does have the proposed uh, parking changes. Uh, so I've just kind of highlighted the areas that would change. If it's not identified on there, it would remain as is. So uh, that first section of Court Street, uh, the first block on the west side would receive a designation for no parking uh, 3 to 6 a.m. Uh, Roundtree Avenue, um, the 
frontage, uh, excuse me, Bailey Avenue, the frontage uh, right by Mount City Bank would not change. It would still remain no parking 3 to 6 a.m. Uh, the rest of that first block on both sides would still be no parking 3 to 6 a.m., but would also receive a three-hour maximum parking uh, designation uh, during the day. So those vehicles would at least have to be moved through the day and they couldn't park there um, all day. Uh, Round Tour Avenue, the uh, sections that are currently undesignated, that first section by the bank on both sides would be designated no parking 3 to 6 a.m. And then that other section there would be similar to Bailey Avenue, uh, no parking 3 to 6 a.m. and three hour parking. Um, so that's the recommendation. The, the rest of that neighborhood, for the most part, is the, the permit parking where residents can get a permit to park on the streets. And then there's that eastern section of Roundtree Avenue where it's uh, there's four spaces that are leased parking through the city's parking program. And then the rest is 24 hour parking, which can continue as it currently is. Uh, any questions? Any questions of Joe? I, I'd like, I'm a little confused. So the, the, the comments came from the residents, the concerns. And we, and we have some residents that have, that would like to speak. So right now just. Okay. 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 So if you'd like to hear from them first. Okay. Okay, Ruth. Ruth, would you like to come to the microphone? Or... It's okay. We appreciate that you have joined us tonight. Thank you, Barb. I'm Ruth Jones. I live at 185. Bailey Avenue, and I've lived there since we moved here in 1967. So you can do the math, that's, <laughs> that's a long time. And my main concern, only concern, is to try to retain our neighborhood as a neighborhood and not a parking lot. And at the present time, at I'll say between eight and nine o'clock, there are 20 cars that park on our street, bumper to bumper. And so has been good enough to consider what our problem is. I would like to say this, that <clears throat> I would like to that the bank um, has different hours, then they just aren't always the same hours. Some leave before others, some come. And so they very easily could Come back at one and go home at four, and there would be the parking still on our street. And so, with three hour, I mean, with two hour parking, that eliminated. And they say we're just trying to maintain our neighborhood. And it is very just always be worried about what's going to happen, what's going to change. Um, that when you go home, it's kind of your safe place. And have to worry about what's going to happen to your property. So that's my story. And then I will just add this of the importance of the council that um, said this before, that when the university, they were parking from bumper to bumper in our street. And 
So the council took care of that and we had parking overnight. And so all of a sudden those cars disappeared. And then one block down from us, a man decided that he was going to have uh, a kennel. residential area and only through the laws that are passed that the council passed was that prevented because there was a law that said you couldn't have x number of dogs in uh, a home and it's that kind of legislation that saves us, saves our community. It makes you want to feel like they're taking care of our residential, we're not business. And we were residential for the first 10 years we lived there. And then anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Monica Miller, you have asked to speak tonight. I'm Monica Miller. I live at 150 Roundtree Avenue. And Miss Ruth and I share a birthday, and she'll be 96 in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Wow. Happy Good birthday. <laughs> Um, today, my husband, um, Dave, and I drove through the street south of Pine from Southwest Road to Hickory and back to Roundtree. On Chestnut Court, Bailey, Roundtree, Hickory, and all the streets in between, there are plenty of permit only, no overnight, no parking this side of street. There are zero, none, not a three-hour daytime parking, none only two hour limit signs, and there are dozens of them. These are all residential streets. Putting three hour limit parking signs on the two blocks of Roundtree and Bailey, when the rest of the streets in this residential area have two hour limit signs seems confusing and inconsistent, especially when these two blocks are two of the most historically significant blocks in Platteville. Thank you. Okay, now, questions. Staff proposal is no parking 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. and three hour parking. The three hour parking, I believe, is a carry through from the downtown parking. Uh, downtown parking used to be two hour parking and then there was a uh, uh, request from downtown businesses to change the three hour parking. So we made that change to three hour parking. Who knows, there may be a change back to two hours sometime. All right, questions, comments? Um, do we have a sense of who um, is parking in these areas in terms of kind of the volume or? Joe? Yeah, well, the, the ones we heard about at the, at the planning commission meeting was the, the employees of Mount City Bank <laughs> and then employees from the post office. Okay. Um, it, there may be others beyond that, but those are the two ones that we heard about. And did they did they make any comments in terms of kind of? Yeah, so they did show up at the the last planning commission meeting. Um, yeah, obviously they they expressed their concerns about th their need to have some parking for for their employees. Um, if it, so, they didn't want to have all of this taken away. But my sense is, um, they were both in both cases they were okay with. The proposal as, as submitted. Um, one of the other options that was talked about was a little bit more restrictive than that, and there was some concerns about uh, about that. So it seemed to be that this was a good compromise, I guess. And there's really no other options in terms of like employee parking for those businesses. Well, Mount, <laughs> Mount City Bank has sixty. See, they have, oh, pardon me. They have 60 employees and 59 parking spots. 
or they have 50 employees and 49 parking spots. I can't quite remember. I don't remember the, the numbers, but th theoretically they, they have enough off-street parking for all those employees, but they also have some of their spaces that they let other businesses use. And then they also, with the, the drive-through facility, they have uh, public meetings that take place at that, you know, blood blood banks and so forth that go on there. So their concern was that if they their employees are using all uh, those spaces, then that's going to impact these other meetings that take place there and some of the other businesses. So it's going to be a snowball effect that kind of impacts all these other businesses that currently are not impacted. Uh, and then the other, I, I know the other, big group of, of people that do park in that area, especially over on Roundtree, that 24 hour parking is the, the tenants uh, of the downtown area, those second floor apartments where the, the businesses or those buildings just don't have any parking. It's just not available. Um, so they had to utilize whatever's close and that tends to be uh, that street. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing staff was looking at is trying to find that compromise it's impossible to keep everybody happy but we're trying to do our best i i would say ha having been at the plan commission and todd you probably would <laughs> echo this is uh i don't believe that the post office employees nor the mount city bank employees knew that they could park on the uh east side of roundtree avenue in those parking spots they didn't realize that was public parking and that they could park there. I think also we took some of the pressure off of the daytime parking by the South Court Street area south of Pine, where we converted that to just a no parking from 3 to 6 p.m. or 3 to 6 a.m. rather, allowing for daytime parking there a number of spots, but also continuing that uh, no parking 3 to 6 a.m., which gets rid of um, that long-term parking. And I believe um, the, the residents talked about boats showing up and, and sitting there all week, um, campers, what have you. So we are able to clear South Court Street every night, and it's open again for people in the morning, first come, first serve, who work downtown. So we seem to take some pressure off. If I'm not mistaken, after all the discussion at the planning meeting, I think we came up with some sort of compromise that the neighborhood was at least reasonably happy with and that we would look forward to perhaps making some changes if necessary, seeing as how this went. If, if, and if I'm misspeaking, let me know. But I think we walked out of there and everybody was reasonably happy that we had done something. I, I, I guess in these cases, nobody's actually happy. And if you walk away with everybody kind of half, un, half happy and half unhappy, you probably have reached the right point. <laughs> And and so I think I think so, uh, Mr. Miller. You did not register to speak. You would need to come to the podium, and now I don't think he needs me. But I would introduce yourself. Yes, I'm David Miller. I live at 150 Roundtree. Uh, the one thing that I would suggest is it's. When you look at the parking on the east side of the street there, we were always under the understanding that that was leased parking and that people couldn't park there. And the signage there doesn't really let you know that that's open for any anybody to park. And that was the only thing I would say is if you could- So it needs to be better signed, there, I agree. It would really clarify and yeah. let people know that they can park there. And Thank you. And I'm sure staff will address that. So any other questions? So I know that I know that you want two, but I also know that we have three downtown. So well, I'm in favor of the two hour parking because I look at it this way. Looking at from Mount City back to Avenue to Mitchell Avenue, no parking 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. and three hour parking from 9 a.m. to 5:30. Well, if I got, yeah, this this is Roundtree. I need to talk about Bailey, excuse me. No parking 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. and three hour parking from 9 a.m. to 5.30. So now when, when you really look at that, somebody could come at seven o'clock in the morning and park from seven to nine and then park another three hours. That makes five hours of parking 
next to Ruth Jones and the other side. I think it's better to go to two hours. That means they have to move more and it gives more chance, a greater chance than that people can park on the street and visit Ruth Jones and other people there. So I, I do not favor the three hour thing. That is still too long. Any other questions, comments, or suggestions? Otherwise, we'll move this to action for our next meeting. I have one more question. That is of Joe. The, uh, you talked about the four spots on the, what is that, uh, east side of Roundtree? Yes, east side. Is there actually space for more than four spots? Do you know the exact distance going from the parallel parking, the perpendicular parking, to uh, down to Pine Street? You, you, you listed four. So the, the four spaces I was talking about are the perpendicular spaces. Um, there are four of them that are actually designated as least parking. But, where but you then there are four up. spaces where they park parallel to Roundtree. And they're going down toward Pine Street. Are you? Yeah, I don't. I, uh, that that's recommended for no parking, three to six a.m. I don't know how many vehicles exactly you could fit in there. I never measured that. I looked at it. it looks like you could have more there, but they're not marked off. So it's just going to be a guessing game as to who gets there. Right. Now you have marked off as far as the perpendicular. Would you? Could we work off the four that go from the perpendicular to Pine Street? No, actually, designate what the, what the spaces are. They they could be designated. However, that just adds more paint and and maintenance of those painted stalls to our our effort. Um, I would prefer to let people just park what they, what they will. I'm pretty sure that you can get at least five vehicles in that, in that area, but it's one of those things where if I have to mark those stalls, I have to mark them as if they are extended cab pickup trucks so that they have enough room for extended cab pickup trucks. But if you have people with shorter sedan cars, you might be able to get a sixth car in there if it's not actually marked with marked uh, stalls. Well, I look at the situation of Staley Avenue. Staley Avenue by uh, the old Dodge house there. They typically park 11 people along that street. There's nothing marked on the street. So they, they can fill it in. And so I think there's more space along there that is being used. So I don't think that extra painting is a great hindrance. Thank you. Okay, like I said, we'll be moving this parking, uh, proposed parking changes to the action agenda for the second meeting in um, January. And now we'll move on to the 2023 city goals. Yeah, so this is kind of going to be your homework assignment from this meeting is to basically look at the kind of draft goals that we have. Uh, this was the combination of, if you remember, go way back to August, when before we kind of hit the budget and everything else, um, we had kind of a strategic planning session to go over the city goals. Uh, so what I did was kind of put all those thoughts and, and ideas into this document. And this is kind of what kind of spat out. So uh, what we're going to be looking for for you to do over the next kind of two weeks is kind of review these goals, um, see if there is anything that you feel should be added additionally. And what will happen is typically this comes back as an action item then on the 24th. If you feel comfortable at the 24th that you want to move that forward, you can adopt it. Otherwise, there'd be an opportunity then to kind of add anything or table it if you feel you need some more time to look at it. But primarily, a lot of the goals that are in here, we talked about um, 
doing some very specific things with Tide. And a lot of this was tying into volunteer volunteerism. So we talked about Tide, uh, talked about, again, having another presentation or kind of comment session, work session to bring in some different presenters, uh, talking about the budget, looking at some historical uh, emphasis, putting that in the budget for future years, uh, looking at some in-service days kind of for the community and staff, creating a volunteer of the quarter, um, then it went into some economic uh, options, talking about housing, uh, looking at different technology that can implement uh, potentially for staff, uh, also looking at ways to kind of grow the tax base, looking at recruitment, um, and then went into some other areas in regards to the museum, uh, the parks, looking at potentially the community center. So that could be something that could be kind of dived into now with the armory. Uh, then looking at the museum and some of their capital improvement planning, uh, talking about phase three of the camera system upgrades, and then also looking at uh, starting to have conversations about the library development agreement, because um, that is something that is going to have to be looked at. So again, the homework assignment for you guys as council members, just kind of look all of these over, uh, see if there's anything else you would really like to identify, bring that information back to staff, and then uh, we will work on making sure that that comes back at the next meeting, and either you can adopt it or potentially uh, kind of hold off on that until you feel comfortable. Okay, questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the basically an information item, an update on the enterprise enterprise fleet management aftermarket cost payment. Yeah. So um, as part of the agreement with Enterprise Fleet Management for leasing vehicles, the city of Platteville is responsible for paying half the cost of over $10,000 for aftermarket items added to the vehicles for equipment, such as plows, salters, etc. Um, historically, these items have been added to the overall cost request in the CAP budget when the city has purchased vehicles outright. It was intended that the sale of city-owned vehicles would cover the cost of aftermarket items for new city-leased vehicles. Due to the supply chain issues experienced in 2021 and 2022, this delayed the ability to calculate the aftermarket item costs as vehicles intended to be received were delayed significantly. Also, this delayed the sale of obviously our old city-owned vehicles. So Enterprise Fleet Management in the month of December notified city staff of the need to finalize the balance for the aftermarket items for vehicles leased within the fire, parks, streets, and water and sewer departments. In total, the aftermarket costs are $93,487, in which our portion of the cost after applying the equity gains of selling vehicles would be $58,787.71. Uh, so in your packet is kind of a breakdown of all the vehicles that uh, were leased with Enterprise so far with fire, parks, streets, and utilities. Uh, so city staff will be authorizing payment of the entire balance of $58,787.71, which will need to be recorded as a 2022 financial transaction. <clears throat> city staff estimates we currently have $26,344 from the sale of two streets department vehicles. City staff verified the parks department sold a vehicle for $3,826, and they have a vehicle pending, which we are estimating will bring in around $7,500. The Water and Sewer Department has $27,450 from the sale of two vehicles. This will cover the balance payment required above, although some of these funds will be received in 2023. So the city will work with Enterprise to ensure we have the forecasted cost for any leased vehicles being purchased or cycled in 2024 to be added to either the CAP budget or various accounts in the general operating budget or the water and sewer budget. So really we're just bringing, there's no action that needs to be done with this. This is more just an informational item. The reason we wanted to bring it to you is just so we're aware when, if you are looking at some of the financial statements and all of a sudden you see a $58,000 cost in there, what, what is that for? Well, because of everything kind of, you know, topsy turvy with the market, we have to finalize this in 2022, but we may not see revenues recognized until 2023. So we just wanted to kind of make you guys aware of the transactions that are occurring, but we do have kind of this budgeted. So it's not going to be, we're not requesting additional money in order to cover this. We've kind of budgeted that through the sale of the vehicle. So this is more just an informational update for you. So I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, in terms of the aftermarket stuff that for vehicles, you know, like plows and everything, do those, are those basically, do they last like the life of the vehicle or now with this new lease program, is it like, oh, we can buy a plow and then in, you know, two or three years or however the lease works, we just need to get the vehicle. We can still use that plow. How does that work? Yeah, so good okay. question. So it depends on what the item is. So okay. like plows specifically, the intention is that will move from vehicle to vehicle. So we will take off the plow 
put it on the new vehicle and that keeps going. Some of the items though, like for instance, if it's the box truck that we're adding to it, that doesn't make financial sense to take off and put on a new one. So that just gets sold outright into the equity game. So typically anything that is more of like, you know, the plows, the, you know, salters, things like that, those we intend to have move from vehicle to vehicle, but some of the other things that are, you know, specifically latched on or part of it, um, that would be staying and then sold. Did I miss anything on there, Howard? Or? Okay. So this wouldn't be like a recurring cost then on an annual basis. So it's something that we will have to factor in. Okay. So what you're going to see in the CIP going forward is that when we do kind of trade out vehicles, anything that's over, you know, it has to be a $10,000 expense in order to make it into the CIP. So if it meets that threshold, we'll have it in there as an aftermarket item. If not, it's something we're going to have to budget into the actual budget then. So you'll see either in the supplies and equipments, we may have an increase that year to cover kind of the transition of those costs. Yeah. This is a different question. Yeah. What has happened to the van that the senior center was going to get? Good question. So that is something that we are continuing to work on. So what happened there was we had essentially uh, a proposal that came in that we were supposed to get a van in August due to the supply chain issues um, that everybody's experiencing, that van no longer became available. Um, so what we have done is we have gone back to um, some of our local vendors to ask them about availability. And the other thing we're looking at is our current van that we have, um, Director Lowe, who I will let kind of speak on this a little further, is doing some kind of price quoting to see about whether or not we can retrofit that to actually include a handicap accessible option. Um, so I'm going to pitch it over to him to let him kind of add on anything I'm missing. But the current van that we have, uh, remember, it's a 2017 and only has 28,000 miles on it. So it's kind of, uh, for what we're currently using, it does work. Now, ADRC happens to be using it more than we are, um, but we're looking at retrofitting that so that if we had wheelchair accessibility on the rear end, it would actually work. So <clears throat> we've talked to Enterprise about a van and we've talked to a local dealer. We just cannot find the kind of van that we had originally wanted to get. It just doesn't, they don't, you know, this still no supply of that so it's kind of an ongoing issue but we continue to work on it thank you you're welcome i'll continue bringing it up but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> any other questions on the information item enterprise sleep management aftermarket cost payment Well, that would conclude the portion of our information and discussion agenda. We do have a closed session tonight. Uh, so I would uh, ask for a motion to go to closed session per Wisconsin statute 1985 parent one parent E, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, investing of public funds, conducting, <laughs> conducting other specified public business, whenever uh, competitive and bargaining reasons require a closed session. Um, and uh, we don't have action to take. So we would uh, then uh, take a motion to go to closed session and then adjourn to open session and adjourn without action. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Jason and a second by Eileen to go to closed session. As stated previously, Candace will vote. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Motion carries.